you cool, I'm cool, you cool, I'm cool, you cool, I'm cool, we coolin' out, you cool, I'm cool, you cool, I'm cool, you cool, I'm cool, we coolin' out. Yo, welcome back to Coolin' Out. We are back. It's Kev. It's Rel. We got a special guest with us this week. Feel that. Ooh, I love the energy early. I love the energy. We got Dr. Elliot Gann in here, a.k.a. Philip Drummond. What's up, man? Yeah, what's going on? How you been, man? I've been pretty good, man. Been working hard, a little sick, recovering, but, you know, it's the yeah, season, yeah, yeah. season of, of the flu. Luckily, I didn't get that. I just got a little cold, so pardon my... Uh, my nasal speaking tone. You got the oh, nasal yeah, no drip. <laughs> Not the drip on this microphone. Yeah. <laughs> you could keep it. Take it home with you. <laughs> I got this SM48. Yeah. Nah, so you're a beat maker, uh, executive director, am I saying that yeah. correct? Yeah, of yeah, yeah, today's yeah. future sound. And I just want to tell people, let's give a little backstory. So yeah. me and Kev are out in Brooklyn. Mm. We're at a, a bar. Yep. Father knows best. Yep. You run over. You're like, hey. You know, my name is Philip Drummond. Da, 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 I do this, I do that. Just give people that same spill you gave us. That's and, that, true. and that spill was like, yo, we got to have this guy on the podcast. Oh, man, the hustle is real. Uh huh. So go, go ahead and give the people the same spill you gave us. Yeah. So I'm Dr. Elliot Gann, mm -hmm. aka Philip Drummond, Filthy Beats. Uh, I'm a licensed clinical psychologist, but I'm executive director of Today's Future Sound, which is a nonprofit that uses hip hop music production as a culturally responsive mental health educational and cross-cultural slash cultural diplomacy intervention. That means we're using beats and hip hop culture to give youth tools and opportunities um, to build very deliberate community bet between beat makers and hip hop artists in their local community, not just in Oakland where we're based, not just here in New York where we do work, but around the world. Mm. Uh, and that's, it's a very deliberate effort that we do. It's kind of coming in using you know they <laughs> should, should I, you no, know? yeah 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 using using hip hop using the beat battles that we put on uh, shameless plug for Saturday the 22nd at uh, friends and lovers 5 p.m. to 9 30 p.m. we're doing a beat battle Chris McQuan's like a beat battle come through but yeah it's a way to to meet new folks in the beat making and hip hop community and then make them kind of aware and cognizant of, of what we're doing and um, as I told you with mm -hmm. the whole sticker thing, right? I wish I had this when I was a kid. That's our, that's our motto. That's our slogan because all the producers, or I would say a good proportion of, of the producers that I meet, when they find out what we do, that we're teaching like, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten year olds how to make beats. Mm -hmm. They're like, man, I would be so raw if something had started <laughs> me when I was nine, 10, 11, 12. And that's what I was looking for. And that's like, well, that's why we do what we do. It's really, it's, to me, it's, it's about that. It's about building community, it's about giving tools and opportunities. Um, we do tend to work in predominantly underserved areas, um, but it's for everyone. It's not mm -hmm. just, you know, we, we work with, you know, people who might, we might say would be privileged as well because there's trauma and there's issues there too. And we want to affect all of society and have a, a better kind of experience for everyone and, and try to build communities through hip hop and beat making. Um, so that's the majority of my waking life is spent thinking about that and how can I reach as many youth as possible? How mm. can I engage as much community as possible? Um, how can we advocate for the use of hip hop as a like see, it, seen within mental health and educational systems as a legitimate form of learning and experience and expression, which is it's kind of start starting to be accepted, but it's still on the fringes, mm -hmm. um, despite the fact that it's the number one most popular genre of music in the world and in the United States mm -hmm. as of like a year and a half, two years ago. So. And, and there's always the issue, too, of like authenticity and selling out. Right. And that that whole kind of thing where. You know, if you institutionalize it, something that came from the streets, mm -hmm. will it be appropriated again by white folks? Will it be exploited? Will it be, you know, perverted or changed or you know, not the same thing that it was? And that's why I think it's really important to have the people on the ground who are beat makers and hip hop heads as the experts, mm -hmm. as the teaching artists who are coming into schools mm -hmm. um, and maybe working for or with schools or juvenile justice centers or in community settings, but people who you know, come from the culture and who are part, you know, uh, practitioners of it and participants in it. Uh, and it's also, you know, something that I think is really important too to acknowledge as a white man is that I'm a visitor in hip hop, right? I'm not, and I think I, I, think I said this to you guys mm -hmm. too. Um, so it, it's important to teach the history, which we do to young folks about where it came from, that it was young black and brown youth, it was young African-American, Afro-Latino folks in the South Bronx in the late 60s, early 70s, mm -hmm. and teach them the history and, and, and where beats came from, DJ Cool Herc and the merry-go-round technique, right? E extending the break 
and then the, the digital samplers and drum machines later and, and where it all came from to give a sense of perspective and history, but also so it's not, I mean, hip hop has already been appropriated by white folks, right? And, and, <laughs> yeah. I mean, beyond <laughs> yeah. our wildest dream, you know, what, what people could have fathomed and, and exploited, et cetera. But uh, I think it's important to, to, to really acknowledge that um, and to, to, to just try to pass that on, right? And as part of our kind of intercultural and um, intercultural exchange and our intergenerational, you know, each one teach one kind of passing on of knowledge in mm. terms of like the fifth element of hip hop um, and to acknowledge that. So it's not just like, you know, hey, like, y yes, hip hop's for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. And and I'll, I'll you know, I, I think it is for everyone, but it's also, you know, just like rock, the blues, techno, house music, R&B, gospel, er mm -hmm. every, it's all black American music. And it's so often that we don't, Acknowledge that like I even saw it was really disappointing because um, I love Aloe Black and I've been a fan of Eminem since Aloe like 99 yeah. But man, I saw I went to Australia and I saw this IMAX American musical history journey, whatever, right? I'm like, okay There's a probability this might be cool mm -hmm. And I don't even think they mentioned uh, Chuck Berry or Little Richard like or Chuck Berry who's like, you know, one of the innovator of, of rock and roll that you have Elvis, mm -hmm. you have Aloe Black going to Memphis talking about Elvis, and I'm and, and, you know and look it's it, it, Australia has its issues with white supremacy too and, and all that but I was just kind of like man this is kind of symptomatic of of this kind of uh, amnesia that we have this convenient cultural amnesia so that's another part of what I try to do in being a, I don't know whether the term is ally or an accomplice these days. Um, <laughs> you know, wh whatever I am in trying to, uh, you know, be as cognizant a white person as I can and someone who's in, uh, you know, is participating in mm -hmm. hip hop and be mindful of, you know, kind of my privilege and my power and my position and all that. So that's something that I try to think about that I think my staff is all kind of aware of and that we have conversations about uh, and try to think about and include in our work. Um, and so that's been an interesting kind of, I, I don't know, area to think about and to challenge myself in. And it's not always the most comfortable thing to talk about. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, you know, <laughs> I don't know. It's just, yeah, it's, it's, you have to challenge yourself. And I, and I think I, I think I do I try to every day, but that's part, I think that's part of the work mm -hmm. and part of the discussion that I had, I've had with my collaborators who range from say like, Shout out to my, my boy, uh, Dr. Alexander Crook, University of Melbourne in Australia, who's been pushing really hard in Australia to bring hip hop and beat making and music technology mm -hmm. into the music therapy space, which is a really pretty white Eurocentric kind of space. Mm -hmm. um, and you look at the post-colonial legacy of Australia, similar to, not, exact, not exactly equivalent of uh, the United States, but in terms of the, the genocide of the indigenous peoples and the continuing uh, kind of white supremacy policies that been in place until 40 or 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so I see him, he's, he's doing a beautiful thing as a white man, really trying to give props to, you know, folks who started the culture, acknowledging African Americans and Afro Latinos as the, you know, the rightful owners and creators of, of hip hop. Um, and also acknowledging the rightful owners the, of the Australian lands or what we call Australia, which mm -hmm. is taken from the indigenous peoples there. Um, and then it's a really interesting intersection there in terms of how a lot of indigenous folks who identify as being black, not in the same way as African-American folks, but identify and are discriminated against as being black, have really taken on hip hop as a mode of resistance, similar to what we've seen here in the United States and mm -hmm. other places, um, and identified with it and used it as a way to call out white supremacy. And, and I think I gotta give Dr. Crook his props for really trying to create a space for, for folks from the community, the hip hop community there. Um, you know, I've had conversations with him, my boy J.C. Hall, who I saw last night, who um, runs an incredible hip-hop therapy program up in the South Bronx. I was telling you folks about uh -huh. at uh, Mott Haven. You, everyone should check out the, the documentary. It's, uh, it's on uh, Vimeo and online. It's called Mott Haven. Just look up Mott Haven documentary. It's a really moving documentary. I mean, I, I, I work at that school, you know, and, I, and I've cried like three times watching the documentary. It mm -hmm. was really moving. So the work that he's doing is really incredible, and I think he and I are both white as well. So we've had conversations about like, what's our role within the culture? Can you be hip hop if you're white? Mm -hmm. And you know, or, or, or can you not necessarily be hip hop, but, but practice and take part of hip hop? Um, shout out to my boy, Dr. Itoko Garcia, who's doing amazing work and has been with hip hop education for years. 
um, with hip hop scholastics. Wait, and I, I, I don't mean to cut it. What, yeah. co- what comes from those combos though? What I think, the- I think, okay. So I think that, um, that, w- okay. So one of the, one of the things that, I, that Dr. Crook and I arrived at after talking kind of ongoingly for a year is, so I used to use the language, we empower youth, mm-hmm. which is rather presumptuous. I told him, you know, I said, I feel, you know, a little strange as a white person come in and talking about social justice and that I'm doing so, you know, or, or something, right? Because I have to think about how I was asked to do a keynote mm-hmm. at a student diversity leadership conference. And I, I, I was like, oh man, okay, this is an interesting challenge. This is really confronting me with like, what, what do you do? What's your positioning? And so in talking to him about that and getting ready for that, uh, we talked about, you know, I, I said, oh, you know, our mission statement says that as a nonprofit and we're, and we're, you know, we got white staff, we got non-white staff, we have African-American, Afro-Latino, you know, we're, mm-hmm. we're I'm going to say a fairly diverse because mm-hmm. gender is something we're trying to address as well, gender inequity and lack of gender representation. We have some uh, instructors who are women, but that's, that's, a, that's another thing. But the conversation really, I think, went to addressing, I said, man, it's weird to talk about, like, even as a nonprofit that is, you know, of mixed ethnicity, mixed race, who am I to say as a white guy, I'm, an emp- I'm empowering young folks or people with their own culture. Like, what's mm-hmm. that? And that's ass backwards. It'd be a part of my language, right? Yeah. So that conversation went from us, like, really trying to be reflexive as, mm-hmm. you know, white men and think about our privilege and power and, who, like, who the hell are we to be talking about hip hop or whatever, which we love and we, you know, have really, I think, informally studied and now formally studied uh, and try to examine our kind of our place. And it went from, you know, change, slightly changing the, the language, but I think in an important way that's hopefully informing a shift in thinking too from, you know, empowering youth to, you know, giving the potential to youth to empower themselves mm-hmm. and creating that space and opportunity to do that. But like, I can't, like, it, it just, it doesn't seem right to say, I can empower you with your own culture. What does that mean? Like, yeah. that's presumptuous. It's, I think it's kind of patronizing and, and it seems to have, I think, flavors of racism in it. Um, if you look at it from like, like a structural standpoint, et cetera, right? Mm-hmm. So I think that led us to reflect on that and to kind of think, okay, and what, and what is my role? Should, should I be doing this? I mean, and I'm not saying I shouldn't, but that's, I started to question that a little bit. Like, should I be teaching directly? Do, you know, um, I've always thought that it's really important to have as diverse a teaching group mm-hmm. as possible. And particularly for, for different populations that we serve, which tend to be predominantly African-American Af- and Latino youth uh, in, in California, some Asian Pacific Islanders, some white kids too. Mm-hmm. But I think it's important to have folks of color who look like the kids. And I'm not saying everyone who's same color has the same experience. That's totally not true. But mm-hmm. some, some of our instructors do come from similar backgrounds or have had similar experiences being non-white or being non-white black in America with you know institutionalized structural racism and factors as they are, et cetera. And it's important, I think, for the, the girls to see women doing it too. Yeah. And that's why it's the gender representation part of it is important. And in terms of the LGTP, uh, I always screw this up. LGBTQ. No, LGBTQ community also having um, folks from that community as well. And mm-hmm. again, this is a challenge that we're facing because I don't believe in tokenism, right? I'm not gonna like try to fill fill quotas or make us look good on the surface when like we should be good from the core, you know? So, gotcha. so trying to think, trying to get people who are just dope practitioners of hip hop and also think about our, our positioning, what we're doing, you know, our intentionality, our impact. And so that was a lot of the conversation that I've had with Dr. Crook with Dr. Garcia, mm-hmm. who is who's a man of color, uh, who does a lot of work with equity and with being culturally responsive and hip hop. And so I said to him, I said, dude, Alex and I, you know, Dr. Crook and I are talking about this and, and I'm kind of lightweight thrown for a loop a little bit and, and trying to think about this. And he, he was the one who said to me, you know, a, akin to what you guys arrived at talking about creating the opportunity mm-hmm. instead of empowering, like creating the opportunity for youth to empower themselves, giving them the space or tools. The equity work that I do in getting white folks to question their white privilege and, and white, you know, uh, white supremacy and that kind of thing is you, you don't, just like in therapy, you don't coerce someone to change, mm-hmm. right? And I'm a psychotherapist. I'm trained as a psychotherapist. So this, as soon as he said that, I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. This, that's right. You're creating a, a space for folks to reflect on and be reflexive about their privilege, their power, 
uh, their identity, uh, what their values are in a non-coercive way where w without placing too much judgment on them, they, they can make that decision for themselves and transform themselves mm -hmm. without being like, you know, coerced into it, right? Because then there's resentment and contempt then there's shame mm -hmm. and, and guilt, which I don't think is the best way to get people to do stuff. You want people to do it at a positive motivation because gotcha. it's the right thing to do because mm -hmm. it's just because mm -hmm. because you want to live in a society that is fair and just where people are not unfairly oppressed or killed or you know treated poorly so he, he i think and shouts to dr garcia dr itoko garcia for um for you know having that conversation with me mm -hmm. and kind of furthering my understanding i think that that was important and i think there's a parallel process there that we try to do even in just the act of teaching someone beat making mm -hmm. or giving them the tools here here's here's you know a beat machine here's some pads here's the equipment what would you like to do I think that that can be transformative. In fact, I know it's transformative. That's the okay. premise of all the work that, that, that I do, that we do, you know, wishing we had that as a kid because it's very seldom that kids in school settings or elsewhere in their life are asked, what would you like to do? What's your opinion? You know, some, sometimes, but like we're always telling, I say always, we're, a lot of the time we're telling kids, no, no, don't, stop, the, you know, you're this, you're that, you're, right? as opposed to what, what kick drum do you think is the dopest? Yeah. Or, you know, and giving them the opportunity and choice. And I think particularly that's probably uh, true even more so for youth of color who are, un and, and folks of color in general who are even more so unfairly told, like, do this, do that, like, mm -hmm. you know, accused or assumed to be, you know, having nefarious motives or whatever be could do to, you know, the systems of racism and, and prejudice that are in place. Um, and so, but I think for anyone, it's super important. Everyone wants to have a, a, a sense of autonomy, control over themselves and their, their body, their self, their being, their creative output. Mm -hmm. um, and so hopefully, I, I mean, I believe that we're offering that by saying, what, what do you want to do? What kind of music do you want to make? Yeah. You want to, you, you want to make house? Cool. Let's make house. You want to make uh, dubstep, you know, or you want to make trap or you want to make cumbia or whatever, right? Um, so it's really about meeting folks where they're at, meeting kids where they're at, giving them, offering them this trans transformational space and opportunity and creative opportunity to discover themselves as a creator and not just a consumer, yeah. right? So, and I believe that builds critical thinking skills. And, and when you can build a house, you can, you, know, you can construct a house or construct something, you can deconstruct it, mm -hmm. looking at the, the gestalt or the total sum of the parts and like disassemble it piece by piece because you understand that the nails hold in the shingles on the roof and that there are cross beams and you know et cetera et cetera right and so and then hopefully i i, I believe that then that offers critical thinking opportunities to, to listen to say like you know you listen to this is an old really outdated example but like you listen to broccoli right um uh, by what was it little yachty uh dr drum drum drum, drum. drum. Mm -hmm. so it's a dope, catchy beat, and it's to me it sounds like an after-school special. They sampled like a like or like Nickelodeon or something. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. like, uh, it's two chords. It's two major key chords. It's just two chords. But then you have the the melody that comes in. So we teach kids. Okay, they took some distorted 808 kick drums, right? That which is this sine wavy sounding kick drum, boom, right? But then they distorted it. They had you know distortion or saturation to it, which is an aesthetic that recently passed two, three, four, five, six years, folks have been doing to 808s, right? Who knows if it happened by accident or it was intentional, but it's become an aesthetic, right? So you got that. Then you got the other 808 drum kits. Then you got the piano chords, which they clearly used a really dinky like piano preset, right? Maybe it was like the FL Studio preset piano one or whatever, right? And they played these two chords. Yeah, that's what they did. Right? Continue, yeah. They had to. Because that's, that's the <laughs> no, FL. I have no idea what you're that's talking the about. FL. They had to. <laughs> no, if you, if you go into Fruity Loops. You never is, used Fruity Loops before? Mm -mm. I did for a hot minute. You man, know. me oh, too. I then I realized, but I realized I was trash at beat making, so I gave no, up. No, 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 no. That's the thing. I realized I was trash at beat making <laughs> after three or four years, but someone told me to keep on going. Mm. And I did it for about three, four hours. <laughs> mm. Well, then that's even less of a chance you gave yourself. Listen, we'll try to amend that. We'll, 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 we'll do a beat making experience at some point yeah because I, I think we've developed a pedagogy that allows folks to have a, a certain kind of template mm -hmm. right uh to to be able to create something that's decent and, and having like put like 
thousands of hours into thinking about like the pedagogy. How do you teach beat making to kids, to people mm -hmm. who have never done it before? And so that's really what I was talking about in terms of deconstructing uh, broccoli, right? You just, you show them the parts and then they can listen to it. So they can dissect it in a different way. And I think that makes them, hopefully it's transferable to other creative and other domains in their life where they start to look at things and, and start to question it, mm -hmm. start to think critically or start to be curious about things, you know? So it's actually interesting you said that, like, because I, I was in the band elementary all the way up to high school right yeah and when i listen to music i like i, I call it call it out all the time i can like dissect every single instrument that's being played and a beat in the what did background you play in the i played uh baritone trombone trumpet too but like mostly low brass and just okay. trumpet for the high brass but like i can literally like hear different instruments all yeah, the time and, like right. i can sing a lot of instrument and play that beat all the way through mm. i think that's so cool that you're, that you're like teaching kids that at a young age though yeah, and I think the criticism of us would be from people who are threatened or you know, on this traditional mm -hmm. kind of white Eurocentric musical kind of thing that we have implemented in schools or whatever. And it doesn't have to be that. Not. It can be other folks who play other instruments. Well, you know, everything's on computers and we don't need more screen time these days. And mm -hmm. I would say, I mean, I agree with you. And I think kids should be exposed to musical instruments as well. I think band is... And, and the black church, like I know so many folks that have learned to play piano by necessity. They were sat down at the piano in church. <laughs> by necessity. Said, play. And they learned. What else? And they, and they learned, <laughs> right? I mean, it's like, no, but seriously. Yeah. And, and churches now account for, if I'm not wrong, the majority of the musical instruments that are purchased in the United States. If I'm not mistaken, it's, I a, wouldn't it's be a large surprised. market share. So to me, that's dope because then you get folks who are already have the, the, the technical and musical skill and aesthetic understanding of music mm -hmm. where I just get them on pads and I know I can tell when people play piano or drums when, when they hit the pads mm. I can tell the way they curve their fingers I can tell the way their, their timing and their sense of timing and combination of, of rhythm and melody right mm -hmm. so that's a beautiful thing now what I tell folks who are like man why like we should be training kids kids should get a classical music I say yeah that's fantastic but A you have to meet kids where they're at mm -hmm. and Every piece of music that we hear, pretty much, nothing, what's, what's straight to, you know, lathe or vinyl or tape, nothing. It all goes through a computer, right? So it's all being digitally processed. These are the skills of the future. And you also have to meet them where they're at, and then you work them back, just like so many hip hop producers do. Like Madlib, starting with sampling and vinyl, if you know Madlib, right? And then he starts to teach himself instruments, and then he makes his own jazz band mm -hmm. comprised of himself. You know, DJ Premier starts probably with, with sampling and with records and buys himself keyboards and teaches himself how to play bass lines and little quirky melodies with like the, you know, the Triton or whatever he's got in, in, in you know, in D&D studios or whatever. So I think you start there and you say, hey, you wanna make really dope beats? Mm -hmm. Check this out. Because we bring in piano keyboards and we show them, you know, C major relative A minor scale. We teach them about chord progressions, but in the, in the context of beat making, where it's culturally relevant, it's relevant to their reality, and it's of use to them. Gotcha. Because you try to shove algebra down someone's throat, unless they're a math person, they'd be like, what is this? I have no Kevin use loves for this. math. That's him. <laughs> okay, so for him, it's interesting. He thinks in a mathematical way. <laughs> yeah. So, so if I was working with him, teaching him beats, I would talk to him from, from an algorithmic perspective, where, like, are, are you into trigonometry and calculus and all that? I love it. Okay, so this is the basis of sound design. Right, like this is frequencies which can be f like physically, well not physically, but concretely represented. This is both concretely and abstract, but like we, we can visualize the sound waves. Like I'm seeing my sound waves and my voice right on the display of your screen right now, right? Yeah. Um, and so that is amplitude, right? And, and you have the zero point crossing, uh, you know, the x-axis, and then you have the, the you know, the uh, amplitude of my voice, which is the decibels, which is exponential, right? And then you talk about the design of sound because the sound that I'm creating right now, like, and this is the math and science of beats, we, we, we teach that too, right? So the, my sound is being generated by the vibrations of the muscles in my larynx, et cetera, and then that's vibrating air, and air molecules are smashing into each other to create sound. Sound is vibration. And so naturally, when, we, when I have my little JBL speaker out and it's got the silver woofer vibrating, Every kid and sometimes adults touches it because mm -hmm. that shit is vibrating and it looks cool and it, and it feels cool, right? And that's 
oscillations. That's back and forth movement. That's the equivalent of crossing over the x-axis, up and down, up and down, those sound waves that are being produced. And so you combine a sine wave, right, which you would know from trig trigonometry, which producers know, because a sine wave is basically what an 808 kick drum is, or a bass tone, a pure bass tone is, if you pitch it down, or that's going to be equivalent to, you know, the, the West Coast, G-Funk, Dr. Dre, uh, DJ Quick, Jelly, you know, Jelly Roll, high, like, you know, uh, mm -hmm. what is that? That was actually a Moog from uh, Funky Worm from Ohio Players, but that becomes like in, in the Planet Fat, you know, racks that people are using, you know, that you'd see in, uh, you know, in most old school studio producers, you know, studio and, 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 uh, and, and uh, what's his name? Uh, Premier. So, they, so the, there's the physics there. There's the, the physics and the math of, 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 and the math and the science of beats. But then if someone's more like kinesthetically oriented or they're more musical, maybe you're more musically oriented. Mm. I, you know, well, I mean, that's I your, try to be. Yeah. But I mean, you play multiple <laughs> instruments, you're multi instrumentalist. Yeah. Then I'd say to you, I'd say, okay, he's, he might be, you know, he might, you might be your modality of learning. Everyone's, I think, is experiential, but some people need to sit and watch. But you might be kinesthetically oriented and musically oriented where you need to hit the pads or the keys and see what they do. Or you'll understand intervals. Mm -hmm. And then I'll say to you, okay, check this out. What if we took a sample and chopped it up and we used the song as an instrument? And then you can divide it into quarter note chops. And then you would still be able to understand certain intervals and changes mm -hmm. by how we chop the sample. But then it's also different for you, too. And then experientially, you'd learn by doing. And so for you, you'd learn by doing maybe math and the integration of, like, you know, the sound design or chopping samples and seeing the waveform and understanding mm -hmm. the, the kind of the calculus and the trigonometry of it. So it's, that's really part of um, our ethos and our pedagogy and our model as well is being addressing the multiple intelligences and related but not synonymously, meaning there's different learning styles that relate to people's different multiple intelligences, whether you're a visual learner or, or like a kinesthetic learner by hit, you use your body by, to learn, right? Mm -hmm. People just do stuff, like some people are more handy than others that can put together Ikea furniture or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Not me, I get my brother to do that, because <laughs> I'm, I'm hella lazy. Um, no, but like, you know, you see what I'm saying? So different people are good at different things. Some people are good at everything and I envy them, um, but, People learn in different ways, yeah. and hip hop naturally w is adapted and developed into something that encompasses all of those multiple intelligences and learning styles. Yeah, I hate I hate to cut you. No, off, no, no, my bad. You, I'm a talk. No, no, no. You're on the roll, and I love it. But so let's let's kind of unpack all of this. Let's unpack it all. Yeah, yeah. We got to talk about like origins. Like sure. I, we can you know breeze past that. But you yeah. know she's talking about like white people appropriating culture and all those things. Mm -hmm. Like. You're you're Jewish, correct? Right? I am you're Jewish. Jewish guy. I'm I'm I, I'm kind of like culturally, ethnically Jewish, but I don't practice. Okay. I'm a, I'm a hardcore atheist. Okay. Dare I say that? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, it's not that. It's just like that's it a is what that's it is. A, a, a staunch you know difference. It, like, it ah. is. It is. I respect, anyway. I respect tradition. I respect no, of culture. course. But so you're you're from Queens? No, no, no. I'm from I'm from Manhattan. I thought you were from Queens. I wish I was. That give me way more street cred. Oh, uh, damn! Yeah. How'd I miss that? Like, maybe I was drunk that night. But yeah, so you're from Manhattan. I, I'm glad you think I'm from Queens. That's a compliment. <laughs> so you're from Manhattan. Yeah. You, when did? So you're a clinical psychologist. Clinical psychologist. How yeah. that? So just talk, talk. So just talk me quickly. Yep. Clinical psychology. How'd you get there? And how did that branch? You doing psychology? How that mesh with your love for hip hop? And, and now, how long you've been making? Yeah, and beat. now, and, yeah, yeah. and then how did that collaborate to make today's future sound? All right, so we'll just do a quick, uh, you know, points along the timeline. Yeah, because I want to get you back to your All right. 1992, your role. 1993, uh, Cypress Hills, Insane in the Membrane comes out. Mm -hmm. I'm going into fifth grade. I see that the summer is probably 1992. Oh, maybe it's 91 going to 92. Um, going into fifth grade, I'm pretty sure it was that, or fifth to sixth grade, whenever that came out, and I was like, wow. This is this is hype. Like, what is this? This is mm -hmm. exactly what I've been looking for. This gets me energized. This captures this kind of feelings of pre-adolescent angst that I'm experiencing and energy and vitality and like it's dope. It's in the pocket. It's got this this. They, they take the best part of the song and they play it again and again. Are you kidding? That's what I do with my tape rewind. Yeah, I was <sighs> like before I knew what the pause tapes existed. I was rewinding to replay the my favorite parts of like rock songs or yeah. whatever, right? And oldies. So. The concept of playing the best part again and again, especially in the, in the time of tapes and early CDs, is like 
that's dope and it sounds amazing and rapping is so dope and it's so hype and it's you know and it, it's so and I think there's this kind of rebelliousness and angst and et cetera that it's and just musically sonically it captured me and I loved it and then I heard in fifth grade I remember distinctly seeing the music video for a Tribe Called Quest scenario be like this is dope like it's a real meta with like the video edit the 90s mm -hmm. video editing and tracker stees and um, and it was also like I was growing up in New York in the 1990s in the golden era of hip hop and that was what was cool so I think that plus just hearing scenario and I remember Lauren Adolphson rest in peace brought in the tape uh, tape cassette single and put it in the class boom box and everyone would just rap along with it and it was so dope it was just it was amazing. Um, so I fell in love. I think I started to fall in love with hip hop then. I was all, already like hardcore into music and all mm -hmm. different, like learning about different kinds of music. Um, and again, it's New York in the 1990s. I'm growing up in Manhattan. Um, you know, Doggy Style came out and that was an amazing album. Um, Wu Tang Clan came out, you know, Midnight Marauders, Enter the 36 Chambers, De La Soul, you know, Balloon Mind State. All of that. Um, you know, the Beastie Boys. I always wanted to be a Beastie Boy when I grew up. <laughs> Still do. Um, and being a New York Jew, that's like a kind of a, maybe a more achievable goal, you know? <laughs> I mean, not fully, but like, yeah. you know what I mean? It's close. It's like, oh, I, maybe I could do that too. Um, so I see that and I start to really fall in love with hip hop and electronic music and beat making and kind of the early manifestations of beat culture. And I'm learning about house music. Um, I'm learning about electronic music. I, I, you know, I get to travel some and get kind of like worldly perspective. Now I come from a home of, so my parents split up when I was, when I was uh, five or six. So my stepdad, who's from England, well, interesting context, white English Irish guy grew up in the, it, it, until he was 11, in, about 50 miles from uh, Joss in the high plains of Nigeria. Mm -hmm. So that's an interesting kind of intersectional yeah. context. <laughs> uh, and then goes to Irish boarding school in the 60s with like hardcore fathers that are like ex-boxers that like knock you out if you, you know, get too out of, out of pocket. So interesting. Interesting. So he's, but he's living in Switzerland. He comes over and lives with us. My dad uh, moves out to California to San Francisco when I'm nine. So I spend time in between the coast, between the West Coast and the East Coast, between the San Francisco Bay Area and San Francisco and New York City. Um, fall in, and I get it. I, you know, I fall in love with hip hop and electronic music and culture. Start to learn more and more about it. Kind of teaching myself, going to hella shows. And it sounds funny being in New York saying that because I swore I would never say hella. I'd <laughs> always say mad, but it's a transition. You uh, live in Oakland now. Yeah, yeah, it's true. But going to like hella hip hop shows in mid to late high school. Like I was, I saw, um, I saw Karis one on fifth of May. Um, back when he was kind of more in his prime. Mm -hmm. I saw Arsonist and Nonfiction at the Bowery Ballroom. I got the eight and a half by 11 sticker in the VHS cassette to prove it. Uh, you know, I was hanging out at HMV on 86 and Lex after school in the hip hop section. The CD's playing. What is it? It's Stretch Armstrong volume one. And I'm like, what is this? What? I hear like Eight Steps to Perfection by Company Flow. I'm just like, what is this? I hear um, Closer to God by. Uh, is it Lace the Booms? No. It's um, the dude from uh, um, Totally Escapes Me Now. But anyway, that, so that puts me on the stretch in Bobbito, and I'm all, already kind of listening to the halftime show mm -hmm. with DJ Eclipse and Riz uh, on uh, WNYU. So I'm, I'm learning more about underground hip hop. Someone tells me about Fat Beats. I go into Fat Beats, you know, and like Ill Bill from Nonfiction is working there, so on and so forth. So my journey is starting there and going to all these underground, you know, going to Executioners, X Men shows down at the Wetlands. Uh, tramps, right? Like just uh, SOBs. Mm -hmm. I start getting into battle rap and, and all that. And then I go out to Cali for college in 99. And I'm close to LA. I'm close to Project Bloat. Uh, I start, you know, have access to the internet and my own computer. I was going to buy a beat machine. I remember going to Sam Ash in like 99, maybe 98. And, and trying to be like, oh, I want to get an MPC or I want to get an S900. I want to get an S20. I want to make beats. I want to DJ because I really, I'm loving hip hop culture. I want to do all of it. I can't write graffiti worth a dime. I tried mm -hmm. it one night. I was my, my hand style was terrible, <laughs> and to be honest, I just don't have the, the balls for it. Like I can't go around. Yeah. So okay, that's not. So I don't know if I can break dance. I tried that. wasn't too good at that. <laughs> uh, 
I, I can kind of make beats and DJ maybe. I start, I've been collecting vinyl since I was around 12, so I, I've got the digging kind of down. Start to make beats in 97 on my brother's computer on Mixman Studio. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, you know, Deep Concentration is a, Om um Records put it out. It had Lesson 6 by Cut Chemist, mm -hmm. which I also heard on Liquid, was it Liquid Radio, Liquid Todd, K-Rock. It was this hip-hop electronic music program on Saturday nights. So I heard that, and I was like, damn, that's ill. Is this, you know, it's, a, it's an homage to the early, I think it was Lesson 4 or Lesson 6, which is like a scratch compilation, you know, beats and scratches. I hear that J5, find out about Jurassic 5, get real deep. So I start making beats then. I get my own computer because uh, the guy at Sam Ash is like, nah, man, if you're going off to college, you're getting a computer, just use the software, dude. It's not as sexy, it's not as romantic as having an MPC, but it's more cost effective. And it's like having an MPC on steroids. Mm -hmm. So I do that. I start collecting records more. I meet all these, you know, hip hop cats and, and, and scratch DJs, turntablists, most of whom, to be honest, are, are Pinoy, are, are Filipino, especially out in Cali. They dominate the turntablism stuff. Mm -hmm. So I used to hang out at the Filipino frat at UC Santa Barbara where I went to school because they had all these Technique 1200s and like 05, you know, Vestax 05 Pro set up. And they're scratching the shit. They're doing double click orbit, you know, crab scratches. So I'm getting exposed to the L.A. hip hop scene and digging culture and get more access to through the Internet to underground hip hop, start going to shows in L.A., flying out to Scribble Jam in Cincinnati. That's what, 2002, three, no, two, 2003, four, five I go. And by this time, I'm starting, oh, no, two, three, four. Anyway, I'm, I start to document. I start to put on my own rap battles because I have access to uh, to a video camera through the through the, the university, I'm starting to really, you know, get into making beats, exploring software, digging samples, meeting all these producers. I'm going hard on the undergroundhiphop.com producer forum. Mm -hmm. Shout out to all my homies I met there. Decap, if you know who Decap is, is the number one selling drum kit in the world. Met him through, you know, he's a, a good friend that lives out in San Francisco. Shout out to Illmind, who started on those boards too. Who wow. I'm going to Black Chat after this. The dude's blown up, you know, produced for Kanye, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I remember when he was starting to blow up, but it's crazy to see him now. Uh, there's so many people that I've now met in real life through that undergroundhiphop.com producer forum. It's, it's crazy, like on a national and international basis. So I'm nerding out on the internet, both in the, in the beat making production world and also in the battle rap, mcbattles.com. Uh, and, you know, I started to really watch and get into rap battles go to Scribble Jam, and then I started to put on my own rap battles and got real deep into that. And I've, I amassed this massive collection of, of footage online. I'm shipping bootleg footage and footage to, you know, Australia, South America, Europe, etc., and start to document and put on bigger and bigger battles. And that's towards the end of um, college. And then I move up to the Bay for graduate school. All the while, I've, I've been studying psychology. Um, I went my... Uh, my, just to give you a little context on that. So I've always been into, uh, you know, being a very empathic person. And my parents, I didn't get to say this, but three of my four parents are psychoanalysts. So that's kind of informing, you know, my care for people and thinking about how, to, you know, healing and that kind of thing. And out of high school, that summer of 99, I went to Croatia and I worked with, uh, volunteered with war-traumatized Bosnian Muslim Croatian Serbian kids. Mm. And that was a pretty, uh, light, I guess, uh, existentially jarring or affirming, I should say, experience where I'm working with, you know, kids who've been exposed to pretty, you know, severe complex trauma in early childhood and have been discriminated against based on their ethnicity, religion, etc. So that's affirming my, my, my uh, choice to go into psychology. Mm -hmm. um, and then I start to merge and synthesize kind of like, how does this overlap with hip hop? How can we use hip hop to, to teach, to help people to grow? And th that starts to gel in college and by my senior year of college, being so involved in the hip hop world and in psychology and in you know, really trying to think about social justice and having a positive impact on folks and communities, okay, well, hip hop is this modality that's fun and cool and empowering and it contains all these kind of intelligences. And so it starts to gel. And by senior year of college, I've started the hip hop club at, at uh, UC Santa Barbara. I'm putting on battles and putting on community events and volunteering in the community. And I'm knowing that I want to go to graduate school for psychology and do my dissertation on, you know, some kind of education or healing, you know, application of hip hop. And then I start to meet people who are active in the hip hop education community, both in the Bay Area. I start to read about them. I move up there 2004, 
for graduate school and I start to get involved in, in continuing to teach it, which I started to do in like 2003 in, in SoCal. And then I, I meet folks who are literally doing hip hop therapy, uh, Beats, Rhymes, and Life, or BRL Inc. in Oakland, California. I meet Tomas Alvarez. I say, I'm going to study you for my dissertation. I'm volunteering in the community, teaching kids beat making and uh, DJing. And, and then from there, I go through graduate school, continue to put on events, transition from putting on rap battles to putting on beat battles. Mm -hmm. I put on a monthly beat battle for 9, 10, 11 plus years. I think it's the longest running monthly beat battle in the world. I've done over 1,000 now at this point. I've uh, wow. done it across six continents. Congratulations. Thank you. It's, it's wow. been a grind. It's been pretty out of control, but it's been a lot of fun. And that's how I'm meeting a lot of these folks. And so I graduate. I, I do my postdoc. Um, meet all the while trying to integrate it into the, the therapy room and the sessions I'm doing. And then basically I go from that to joining uh, Durazo, who started Today's Future Sound, which is my nonprofit. Mm -hmm. He's about to give up. He's like, I can't take this. Like, people are flaky on me. Da, da, da. I said, don't worry, I got you. He decides he doesn't like, you know, working with kids. He wants to go be a traveling musician. He decides to travel the United States in a van, uh, making beats for the next two years. And I basically, you know, start from scratch, building it up, recruiting folks from the local hip hop community, um, really just grinding hard and building up the organization, working in after school programs, volunteering. And that kind of then the next seven years bring us to the present moment where I've, you know, I've gotten licensed as a psychologist. Um, I'm, I've been developing the therapeutic beat making model. I've been teaching and consulting in schools and community settings and juvenile justice settings uh, in the Bay Area, around the country and around the world and really advocating for that to be accepted in a legitimate practice as an acceptable, valid, powerful form of mental health, educational intervention, cross-cultural, cultural diplomacy intervention. And that's, that's how we get to where we are. Wow. Wow. I feel like we're going to have to have a part two. Oh, we're at that time already? Yeah. Wow, yeah, we got we, we got to get out of here because of time constraints. I told you I'll talk your ear off. The boy, Dr. Ellie, again, <laughs> he a busy yeah. man. He got places to be, I but have so much sheesh, yeah. I have so many more questions. We, we, yeah. could, we could do it. We could do it. And and I, I want to also say shout out to, to my folks on the ground here in New York City. Mm. Spacecraft, who's been doing that work for 25, 30 years, who's probably one of the earliest to add, that I know of to implement hip hop in after school programs and arts and all that. He's part of the TFS family here. The Frenetic who I was telling you about, who performed that night at Father Knows Best. Mm -hmm. He's rocking with us Saturday at uh, the Chris McQuanzica Beat Battle at Friends and Lovers in Brooklyn. Shout out to Yume, who's on the ground doing that. I love Friends and Lovers. Man, go ahead, sorry, go I, I've ahead. never <laughs> been there. I'm in for a treat. I love Father it's, it's, it's Knows Best. It's a nice best. place. It's a okay. nice place. Nice venue. Yeah, they're good folks. We'll be doing that 5 to 9.30 if folks hear this before then. If not, don't worry. We're coming back March 2nd. We're going to do another one. So, um, yeah, man. Um, yeah, we'll definitely have to schedule. Oh, yeah. Oh, March 2nd. Yeah. I'll be in L.A. Oh, that's the We're next time you coast. be in the city? Uh -huh. I think, yeah, I'm here till the 25th. So, and then you're not you know, back until March? Y y I could be coming back. I just have to see my schedule. We'll talk. We'll okay. talk. Yeah. We'll definitely talk. Yeah. I want to hear your thoughts on, I have you know, current so things, current music, mental more health questions. and hip-hop. Man. So I'll, next time, definitely. Glad, up, gladly talk with you. You should get my boy J.C. Hall on the show. He's amazing. Mm. Doing the hip-hop therapy program in the South Bronx. Mm. Like, just pioneering and really doing it. And... The frenetic is an incredible person too. I think it'd be great for the show. Who's mm -hmm. just like smashing it on social media and in in life. Well, we'll get the info. Yeah, we'll get yeah, him. Yeah. Woo. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for coming, man. We're definitely gonna have you back. On. I got one more New Yorker for you. Go ahead. But he lives in the Bay, but he comes back to New York, and he'll probably be here in March. That's fine. Unlearn the world. Unlearn the world. Marlon Marlin Richardson. Carlos Marlon Richardson. He's been smashing it this year. It's been such an incredible year for him. He's holding it down for hip-hop in the bass so hard and just, like, such an incredible artist and one of our senior instructors who's just, like, I think he'll be here then, too, and he's amazing. Check him out. Unlearn the World, incredible MC, incredible beat maker, activist, community leader, just holding it down, and, you know, that's... I, I love it, man. Let the people know where they can find you on uh, IG or social media, yeah, yeah, all your yeah. platforms. All right, so most importantly... You can Google or go onto Instagram or Facebook and look up Today's Future Sound. On Instagram, it's just at Today's Future Sound. On Twitter, if you're in the Twitterverse, it's at TFS, as in Today's Future Sound, underscore Beats, B-E-A-T-S. Uh, we're on YouTube as well. I'm on uh, Instagram as Philip Drummond with two L's, D-R-U-M-M-O-N-D. On Twitter as Filthy Drummond with the P-H. 
Um, you can check me out. I've, I got my YouTube channel that's got all sorts of crazy battle footage going back. Mm. Um, SoundCloud is Philip Drummond. Spotify is Philip Drummond. You can check out my music and my beats on there. Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, check it out. There's a lot of incredible music coming out in the underground that I'm really excited about. So um, I, I'm constantly inspired. And um, yeah, check out our beat battles. Check we out our beat battle it. footage and all that yeah. stuff. And um, yeah, maybe next time. Who knows? Maybe I'll bring the beat machine in next time. We'll maybe. Rock the beat, the put beat it set on, or something. We'll have to get a video you know, of, Jer- of Rel and Kevin trying to make some beats. Struggling. Let's do it. I, hey, not struggling. Y'all will succeed. <laughs> I know you will. Oh man! Yeah, bro, you're not I, an accomplice. I like that image. Oh, you're an ally. Okay, you're an ally. You I are heard passionate a, I heard a, and very powerful. I heard accomplice powerful. is is actually a, is a higher level of commitment and better than being an ally. What did you say before? So Imposter was it? No, no, you no. Question: no. Rather, you were something or an ally? No, 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 no. I said I said an accomplice or an ally, but accomplice means you're not just an ally. You're in it. You're you are so uh, in it you that you're an accomplice. That is not is not just like oh we're an ally like so you know okay we got your back like yo I'm in it with you. I disrespected you then. You're no. definitely an accomplice. Okay, I'll pre- <laughs> you No, you, you just misunderstood. And see, that's the thing. I think if these conversations could happen more often between folks, like to, to say, oh, I misunderstood, or I, or I was misunderstood, or I felt misunderstood, mm-hmm. like how much better could the world be than people like just following through on a misunderstanding and, you know, having nuclear war or whatever? Whew. I'm just saying. No, nah, damn. We definitely got. We definitely have to get you back, yeah, man. Thank you so much well, for coming you for through, time. man. Thank you. Make sure you guys check out today's Future Sound, um, YouTube, all that good stuff. All the links that he just mentioned. You flooded me with links, <laughs> bro. I'm, I'm sorry. I did. I <laughs> no, it did. wasn't a bad thing. It was like I, I watched most. I was like, yo, it was, it was a lot. You know, I didn't have to go search for it. you. Better, better it due me. diligence, you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, than than you know not being informed. I I only partially did my due diligence and I only when I jumped on the subway today started listening to your podcast so that's fine man that's fine. lo siento my bad no uh, need, I'll come man. prepare next but time but no no need to come prepare because you don't need to really learn us you come and then we have this conversation and now you know us true true period yeah <laughs> experiential learning exactly in the man. moment thank you for coming on no, as always people thank you for listening to the podcast please 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 make sure you rate share subscribe check us out igtv youtube soundcloud all those places apple music all that stuff we're everywhere we got the full length episodes on youtube and igtv cutting those up for you guys we got some more major things coming in 2019 um wait no let's come out after christmas so whatever merry christmas happy kwanzaa what other holidays? Hanukkah, are Christmas, Kwanzaa. Yeah, Hanukkah. Happy belated Hanukkah. Everything. Mm-hmm. Happy belated everything. Happy holidays. Pagan we holiday, love you. Whatever. Celebration, whatever. You know. Everything. Smash right. the subscribe button. Yes, yeah, exactly. Wild out for New Year. Wild out for New Year's. <laughs> Have fun. We love you guys. It's cooling out. Happy holidays. Yeah. Stay cool. You cool? I'm cool. You cool? I'm cool. You cool? I'm cool. We cooling out. You cool? I'm cool. You cool? I'm cool. You cool? I'm cool. We cooling out.